short, we had candles. And a good deal of the actual work on the speech was done by candlelight. I dictated some, but in the main, I wrote it out in longhand. And my secretary copied it by candlelight. Then I rearranged it. We worked on it in that way, evening after evening. The speech seemed an important task to me because up to that time, no one had disclosed to the world what the case really amounted to, what the evidence was, and what law we were contending for. There had, of course, been different phases of it exposed in articles or speeches, but the whole overall picture of the Nazi conspiracy and the planned crimes had never been set forth. The newspaper correspondents <coughs> had been unable to envision what we had in mind as the overall plan of the trial, even those who had long been in Germany and knew the facts. Not only the newspaper men, but many of our own staff couldn't envision it, envision it because it was necessary for them to concentrate on narrow tasks concerning special phases of the problem. The bringing together of all of the evidential material had not been done nor its sweep and effect envisioned by many of the people there. <clears throat> the speech seemed likely to have important public consequences <clears throat> because it would be the first full disclosure of the materials that we had captured and had at hand, and of the use that we attempted to make of them. I had a rather strong sense of responsibility about the speech and recognized that it was probably the most important task of my life. The speech, of course, began to take shape as we worked on it night after night, and whatever daytime we could get, and on Sundays, and on such occasional days I could take away from the office. I was much less subject to interruption at the house. One of the problems was the selection of the material to use and what to eliminate because the quantity was so vast that it was quite impossible to cover more than a small part of it. <clears throat> so the selection of the evidentiary material that I would recite in the speech was very important. Colonel Story, my son, Whitney Harris, Gordon Dean, and others, all were helping to dig out the kind of material that I wanted. I had many consultations with the men who were working on particular phases of the case in order to get the documents that were most useful. Because our collection screened by our staff included 100,000 documents and more, those who had done the screening selected about 5,000 of these for translation all of them practically being in the German language in the original. We used in the trial a little over 4,000 documents. Each document, as it was translated, <coughs> was made the subject of an abstract, which would indicate the persons implicated, the subject that it dealt with, and a brief of its contents. <coughs> Each day I received a sheaf of those from the staff as they went from document to document. I attempted to <coughs> arrange them under various headings that I wanted to use in the division of my speech. A small room, which was a sort of conservatory, opened off from the room that we were using as an office at the house. And it was all windows, except the inner wall against which stood a table. On this table, I laid out in piles under different titles the abstracts of the evidence that impressed me as being useful. I did it under protest from my secretary, who thought, of course, she ought to file them. But I argued that I couldn't see them all in a file, and I wanted them laid out so that I could see the whole collection on this table. I assembled them gradually into piles on which I had noted the headings of subjects that I wanted to use for the speech. About the time that these neat piles were ready for use, which included a thousand at least 
separate pieces of paper piled up in different fi piles. The housekeeper left the windows open and would air out, as Germans do during the day. A storm came up, and all of my collection of abstracts either went out the window or were soaked with rain and piled up all over the floor. So I had to go to work and make a new collection with considerable profanity. <laughs> and I think a little bit of sardonic satisfaction on the part of my secretary, who had insisted that that was a wonderful way of assembling material. I'll give you a few excerpts from this report to the president. In a world torn with hatreds and suspicions where passions are stirred by the frantic boast of British word. The four powers have given the example of submitting their grievances against these men to a dispassionate inquiry on legal evidence. The nations have given the example of leaving punishment of individuals to the determination of independent judges guided by principles of law and after hearing all of the evidence for the defense as well as the prosecution. We have documented in German sources the Nazi aggressions, persecutions, and atrocities with such authenticity and in such detail that there can be no responsible denial of these crimes in the future and no tradition of martyrdom of the Nazi leaders can arise among informed people. No history of this era can be entitled to authority which fails to take into account the record of Nuremberg. And then he went on to what seems to me to be one of the most cogent lessons of the trial. And I'm quoting again. It has been well said that this trial <coughs> is the world's first post-mortem examination of a totalitarian regime. In this trial, the Nazis themselves, with Machiavellian shamelessness, exposed their methods of subverting people's liberties and establishing their dictatorship. The record is a merciless expose of the cruel and sordid methods by which a militant minority seized power, suppressed opposition, set up secret police in concentration camps. They resorted to legal devices such as protective custody, which Goering frankly said <coughs> meant the arrest of people, not because they had committed any crime, but because of acts it was suspected they might commit left at liberty. They destroyed all ju judicial remedies for the citizen and all protections against terrorism. The record discloses the early symptoms of dictatorship and shows that it is only in its incipient stages that it can be brought under control. And the testimony records the German example that the destruction of opposition produces eventual deterioration in the government that does it. By progressive intolerance, a dictatorship by its very nature becomes so arbitrary that it cannot <coughs> tolerate opposition, even when it consists merely of the correction of misinformation or the communication to its highest officers of unwelcome intelligence. It was really the recoil of the Nazi blows at liberty that destroyed the Nazi regime. They struck down freedom of speech and press and other freedoms which passes ordinary civil rights with us so thoroughly that not even its highest officers dared to warn the people or the Fuhrer that they were taking the road to destruction. The Nuremberg trial has put that handwriting on the wall for the oppressor as well as the oppressed to read. Thank you. Bill, that, that is absolutely one of the greatest uh, talks we've ever heard uh, about the trial and the great role of your father and, uh, and yourself in that trial.